Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for all the things you do for us. We thank you for all your blessings and grace that you give all of us on this call today and all the other students who are on their way to join the class and others who are unable to join the class. We thank you for your blessings and grace to our teacher. Give her all the guidance and all the all the guide all the guidance to impart all the good word that is there in in whatever she teach, she teaches us. And we thank you for looking after us, keeping us in good health, keeping us safe from harm. We ask you to help us to focus, concentrate on this class and apply whatever we have learned in this class. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, we'll get started. So uh, in the previous uh, session, we covered Philippians 1 and 2. And uh, we saw that the Philippians were really very um, advanced in the faith, very spiritually mature people who understood that they had a responsibility in advancing the gospel. Uh, they didn't just stand on the sidelines and clap, even as uh, Paul was doing the ministry work. They did all the ministry work that they were expected to do from their side. You know, So they were fully involved uh, in partnering with Paul in the ministry of God. Uh, so we saw the very active role that they took. And uh, we saw all the words of praise that Paul used uh, when speaking about them. And uh, we also saw that uh, in the second chapter, he uh, focuses on the mind mindset of Christ. And he says that this is the kind of mindset that we are supposed to have, uh, where we place uh, other people's interests before our own. Um, and we also uh, kind of went ahead and uh, looked at Philippians chapter 4, uh, the first few verses, which talk about uh, Yudhya and Syntyche. Um, and uh, so we, we we looked at how these two ladies uh, probably could have applied you know, this passage about having the same mindset as Christ. And uh, we also um, uh, saw uh, what it would mean to have the same mind where, it, where they're being given. They're advised in that uh, passage to have the same mind. And uh, we looked at how it would be necessary to have the same mind when it comes to taking uh, leadership decisions regarding the church. Uh, you know, where you can just uh, simply not say, uh, oh, I, we um, agree to disagree and leave it at that, uh, because the congregation would have, would need one unanimous decision. Uh, so we looked at all of those things. Um, today, even as we, you know, get into uh, chapter four later, uh, we will touch upon a few aspects of that passage, uh, which we did not cover earlier. So, you know, these are all the things that we have um, gone through up to now. Uh, so now getting into chapter 3, um, maybe we could have one person read out verses 1 and 2. And um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take it from there. So verses 1 and 2, please. Can I read faster? Yeah. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so uh, he says that he is repeating these things. And so uh, we have to assume that you know he has uh, warned them earlier about the Judaizers who are asking people to follow the Jewish law, uh, you know, to, to fully receive salvation. So he's probably referred to this, warned them about these people earlier as well. And now he, he says, it is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you once again, you know, because it will serve as a safeguard to you. And uh, uh, he uses uh, some very strong words regarding these Judaizers. Uh, so, uh, these are people who have been, you know, creating trouble for the Galatians, uh, and uh, um, you know, so it's not the first time that they have they are, that they have been creating trouble. So we see that maybe uh, you know the Philippians also have had some encounters with them, and uh, uh, 
or he's worried that they're going to have an encounter with them. And so he says, watch out for those dogs, uh, those evildoers. And you know, he says, those mutilators of the flesh. Um, so uh, coming to this first term that he uses, uh, dogs. Um, now, um, in the biblical times, in, in, that, in the Jewish culture, dogs were not regarded uh, with the high esteem that we give them, you know, today in our current society, uh, we think of dogs as noble. Uh, we think of uh, dogs as friends, uh, and uh, so we have a very different perspective. Uh, but in those days, if if someone is being called a dog, uh, that would uh, definitely be a very high level of insult. Uh, and uh, and so uh, this was a, the term that the Jewish people generally used for the Gentiles. They looked down upon the Gentiles as dogs, you know. And now Paul is using that very same term for the Judaizers themselves. And so uh, they would have taken this uh, very badly, uh, you know. So um, now um, there were families, of course, who had dogs as pets in their homes even back then but most of society regarded them as uh, something very low and of course would not to have uh, would not have wanted to have anything to do with dogs now why did the jews go around calling the gentiles as dogs uh, you know it's because you see they uh, they had they took pride in their identity they were aware that they were the only nation to whom uh, you know, Yahweh had personally come down and given the Mosaic law. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, he literally came down upon Mount Sinai, the entire mountain shook. Uh, and uh, in fact, they had two tablets. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure up to which century they, they, you know, they were able to hold on to those two tablets, um, you know, which were there in the Ark of the Covenant. At some point of, point of time, it looks like they lost the tablets, but they actually had two tablets with them uh, on which God had personally written down the laws. Now, you see, nobody else, no other um, nation in the world had been given this kind of a privilege. So the Jews saw themselves as the children of God. Um, you know, they, they had gone through many political humiliations, you know, due to their sinfulness. God had allowed them to be punished in various ways. But in spite of all of that, they were proud of of who they were their identity as the children of god now in their mistaken pride um, they saw themselves as children of god but began to regard everyone else as dogs now of course that is no way that god would ever look at people so you know they, they got this all wrong but um their idea was that we are the only ones who received the law of god you know where god came down and gave us the law in fact wrote it out with his own hand uh, on two tablets, or at least the Ten Commandments, which he wrote out uh, on the tablets. So they took pride in all of that. And so in their eyes, the Gentiles were uh, regarded as uh, dogs. Uh, so uh, what happens over here is that uh, Paul is saying, you people who are holding on to the law, um, you know, it is you who are dogs. Now imagine how shocking that would sound, you know, because he's saying uh, if you are trying to become children of God by obeying the Mosaic law, uh, then um, then whether you realize it or not, you know, in fact, you are the ones who are in a low uh, state. Uh, you would be equal, you know, to to dogs in that sense. So he's kind of turning the tables on them and saying, "You who think that you know holding on to the law is an it's an honorable thing, well, you know what? It's actually reducing you to the level of dogs. You know, is 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 what Paul is saying over here. So um, uh, now, you know, if any of the Judaizers uh, read this letter, you know, or listened to this letter being read out, it would have really made them think. You know, so uh, uh, yeah, and uh, yes, we have um, Brother Charles Dix. Yes, yeah, you have raised a hand. Please go ahead. Yeah. All right. Um, I think I was talking about the dog, the the, the use of a dog. Even uh, Jesus used it when the Canaanite woman came and was requesting him to heal. I think her daughter. It was like, how can I give the food to dogs? So I think uh, Paul 
was also, I don't know whether the New Testament had been written that he would have read it. If he had not yet read it, then the Holy Spirit might have been using him to use the same word because Jesus had also used it when the Canaanite woman uh, asked him to help her. That's what I wanted to, to put across. I thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, now, uh, it is true that Jesus was aware of the way the Jewish people looked upon the other uh, Gentile you know, people. Uh, if, we, if you observe in all of Jesus' interactions with people, he treated people with dignity. Uh, you know, so um, he was not personally referring to the lady as a dog, but rather that is the way his people, his Jewish people looked upon the uh, Gentiles. And so he is testing her and he says, you know, uh, you know, um, I have come basically for the children of Israel. They are the children of God that I have come to. Uh, and uh, you want me to take the bread and give it to you? You know, he's done that on many occasions. You know, the bread has been given to many, many Gentiles. So it's not exactly a new thing, but he's testing her to see what her response would be. And her response is amazing. She says, okay, fine, don't give me the bread. But even the crumbs, you know, the dogs anyway take it, right? I mean, if you look at a, a, a family setting uh, where you have the family sitting around the table and then uh, the crumbs are, you know, flung to the dogs. So I, am, I at least deserve that. So fine, let the people, you know, let the Gen uh, Jewish people think of me as a dog. But even a dog is entitled to at least the crumbs. Because this woman believes that even one crumb from Jesus' table is enough for that for her child to be delivered and jesus is amazed by her faith and he says my goodness you know you uh you have you know because of your faith you have received uh you know what you have requested and your daughter is fine so uh he he kind of brings out the level of faith that this lady has you know uh, by when he uses that term uh, but then we need to recognize that jesus never treated uh anybody as a dog uh no it was the term that was used by the Jewish people of his time. And he, uh, uh, you know, he points to that. But he himself never, ever treated any, anyone as dogs. And of course, the simple evidence for that is, you know, his work on the cross. Yeah, if he considered uh, the rest of us Gentiles as dogs, he would not even have bothered to be a ransom for us. He would have just chosen to be a ransom for the Jewish people. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, yes. So this was a common thing. Uh, the people of that time were very familiar with the idea that Gentiles were referred to as dogs. And here the shocking thing is that Paul turns the tables and says, you know, you people who think, uh, who, who, who consider yourselves so high because the Mosaic law was given to you, you know what, if you're going to go on holding on to that law and spurn Jesus, you know, uh, if you're going to reject him, just because of this mosaic law that you're holding on to and you are not willing to step into the new covenant which Jesus Christ has established, then you are the ones who are actually reducing yourself uh, to the status of uh, dogs is what he says. And the other strong, strong term that he uses over here is that he doesn't say that they are the circumcised people. He just says that you are the mutilators of the flesh. You see? Uh, so... Um, Circumcision and mutilation would be, you know, two very um, different things uh, because circumcision was a mark of on honor. Uh, circumcision uh, is a mark that you belong to God uh, because that's basically how, uh, you know, um, God had set up this particular, uh, you know, ritual, this particular institution of circumcision. Of course, uh, the, uh, the surrounding uh, nations, uh, many of them, um, not many of them, some of them, Egyptians and a few others also practiced uh, circumcision. They had their own uh, religious reasons for which they did it. Uh, but over here for the Jewish people, uh, the Israelite people, God very clearly uh, told them that they would be doing this uh, to mark them off, to, se to set them apart as God's own people. So uh, they always saw this uh, circumcision as a mark of honor, uh, which is setting them apart as God's people. Uh, but here, Paul does not use the word circumcision. He says, you know what, you people are just being mutilators of the flesh, uh, which again is a very, very derogatory thing to say, uh, simply because uh, mutilation, 
was something very humiliating, uh, something that you would do to enemies, uh, you know. Um, um, for instance, uh, if we were to just very uh, quickly go to Judges chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, uh, you know, where uh, the enemies were always, you know, mutilated in some way or the other, just to humiliate them. Uh, so um, um, Judges chapter 1, uh, verses 6 and 7, if someone could read out, please. I really do hope. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, you know, if if someone could just read out the verses. Yeah, Judges chapter one, verses six and seven. Adonai, sorry, Pastor. Adonai they he fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai Pazik said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off, used to pick up scraps under my table, as have done as I had done. So God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he did there. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the only reason I ask people to read out verses is kind of it gives me the assurance that there are people uh, on the other side of the screen and that they are listening. So you know, it just kind of um, gives also gives me a break uh, so that someone else you know reads and I can be quiet for a little while. Uh, so yeah. So please, you know, uh, whenever I ask if someone could please read out the verses, um, it kind of makes it a little more interactive for me uh, in the sense at least I, I know that there are people actually listening. Uh, yeah. So here we see uh, mutilation actually, you know, uh, being done. So this Adoni Bezek, he in fact talks about how he has done that to 70 kings. And now uh, his turn has come. And now, you know, uh, the Israelites are doing the same thing to him. The mutilation which he did to others, now they are doing to him. So mutilation was always a uh, an act of humiliation where the person is being humiliated. And so now here Paul is saying, you know, you have always seen circumcision uh, as a mark of honor. But you know what? Now, now that the new covenant has come, this thing that you value so much is, um, is actually a sign of dishonor. It is just a mutilation. It no longer has, you know, sp spiritual value or spiritual significance. Okay, so these are all very strong terms that he is using, and the uh, the people listening to him using these terms would have understood what he is trying to convey. Um, so he goes on to say something interesting in verse three. Uh, if someone could read out verse three. Uh, yeah, so this would be Philippians for, for chapter 3, the, verse 3. Yes. Ma'am, for 3-3. Mm. Three, three. For we yes. are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Yes. So he says, you know what? Uh, you people are mutilating the flesh. On the other hand, you know who the circumcised people are? It is believers. They are the ones who are actually circumcised. They are the ones who have uh, done something that has got spiritual value. Uh, and so uh, in what sense, uh, you know, uh, did he mean um, circumcised, uh, that believers are circumcised? Uh, we look at a couple of references. Uh, the first would be Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 15 and 16. Deuteronomy 10, 15 and 16, please. Ma'am, Deuteronomy 10, 15 and 16. 16, yes. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart 
and be low longer stubborn yes um, so you know uh, in in fact in the niv it says do not be stiff necked any longer uh, so um, you see right from the very beginning right from moses times itself uh, god had always insisted that uh, physical circumcision alone is not enough they would also need to circumcise their hearts how in the sense that they should not be stiff necked any longer they should no longer be rebellious and unwilling to you know bend their heads and accept correction and obey rather they must be willing to bend their uh, you know head uh, and bow their neck and uh, submit to the lord obey him accept correction from him so physical circumcision alone was never enough god also always had in mind the circumcision of the heart where you choose to give up um, the things which are un, uh, you know displeasing to the lord uh, the same thing we see even in ezekiel chapter 44 verse 9 um, if someone could read out ezekiel 44 verse 9 Ezekiel forty four nine. Thus says the Lord God: No foreigner, uncircumcised in heart and flesh, of all the foreigners who are among the people of Israel, shall enter my sanctuary. Okay, so uh, so right down to the time of Ezekiel, we still have the same concept running, where um, uh, God is not just interested in physical circumcision, but He also wants circumcision of the heart, and therefore He says. you know i don't want any foreigners coming into my sanctuary who are uncircumcised uh, in both heart and flesh so uh, here paul is saying you know what we believers we are the ones who are actually the true circumcised people uh, why because you know we are living according to what god has now required you know rather than uh, living according to uh, the old covenant which is no longer you know valid uh, so he says uh, we are the you know circumcised people uh, because we no longer put any confidence in the flesh uh, these um, these judaizers were putting great confidence in the flesh uh, you know they were they were earning salvation uh, through uh, through the ritual of circumcision uh, by keeping all the other uh, you know um laws which the pharisees had instituted in and in, in doing all of these things they hoped that they would earn god's favor and earn salvation but he says we believers are not like that we do not put any confidence in the flesh um you know just to look at one uh, one scripture uh, which talks about the great importance that the jewish people gave uh, to the law and how actually this was so inadequate uh, uh matthew chapter 23 verse 24 if someone could read out matthew 23 24 ma'am matthew 23 24 you blind guide straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel is it the yeah. verse ma'am yes yes this is the one uh so um yeah so i you know in the, in the previous verse in fact matthew 23 23 he he says you know jesus is speaking and he says you know you're so careful in giving your tithes but when it comes to more important matters of the law you know you ignore those in the same way he says you know you strain out a gnat but you swallow a camel um uh, you know um insects which did not have jointed legs uh, were not supposed to be consumed you could have a grasshopper because a grasshopper has got jointed uh, legs uh, but uh, but uh, you know um, uh, insects which do not have joint uh, you know joints in their legs uh, you're not supposed to consume them because they were uh, declared by the lord as unclean so uh, basically what this jews would do is i uh, know the ones who are consider themselves very very pious um because there would be small insects you know in the water they didn't have the kind of water supply that we have now you know so in the water which they would be collecting from their wells uh, you know there would be insects uh, so 
the ones who believe that they should be very, very, you know, careful in, in their observation of the law, they would in fact take a uh, cloth and they would strain the water out so that, you know, these little, little insects which are there in the water gets, gets strained out uh, because of the cloth. Um, so Jesus says, you know, you are so careful in straining out a tiny little gnat so that you don't consume it by mistake. But what else do you, but on the other hand, what do you do? An entire camel, which is also equally un, unclean, you swallow it whole. You know, so uh, uh, in the sense, Jesus is saying, um, it's when it comes to small convenient matters, you know, you're very, very careful in following those things. But when it comes to the bigger things, the weightier things, you know, you just neglect those. So the thing about placing confidence in the flesh is that uh, whatever we do, it is never really up to the requirements that God has. And, you know, again and again, a lot of times we've looked at that uh, James 2.10, you know, where it says, even if you stumble, you know, even if you stumble over one single law, one single time and you break it, it's as equal to breaking all of the law. So um, these are things that um, um, have been very made very clear to the believers. So Paul is saying, you know, we are the actual circumcised because we are not putting any confidence in the flesh. In fact, what do we put confidence in? What do we boast about? What do we glory in? We, in fact, glory in Christ Jesus. Because you see, it is his finished work on the cross which has made us children of God, not following the Old Testament law, uh, not following the Mosaic law. That uh, no longer can you know bring us into a salvation relationship. So our boast is not in good works. Our boast is not in the flesh, in, in the works of the flesh. Our boast is, in fact, our glory is, in fact, only in Christ Jesus. Um, maybe we can look at one verse, you know, uh, which touch, touches upon this. Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 5, please. Romans 11, 5. Romans 11, 5. It is the same today for a few of the people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace. Is undeserved kindness in choosing them. Um, verse so six. Eight? Oh yeah, verse, verse six. six. Yes, yes, please. And since, and since this is true, God's kindness, then it is not by their good works. For in that case, God's grace would not be what it is really is, free and undeserved. Yeah. So. Uh, he, you know, uh, Paul points out that we refer to the grace which Christ has offered as grace because it's undeserved, right? Uh, so on the other hand, if salvation was by works, was by good works, then we would no longer say that salvation is by grace. We would say, yes, it is. it has, it has to be earned. So it's very, very clear that our boast should be in Christ Jesus. Uh, our boast and confidence should be in what Jesus has done for us through grace, you know, which we did not even deserve. Uh, so uh, the the boast should not be in uh, the works. So uh, so he he you know this is brought out in Romans eleven five as well. And he then he goes on to say, you know, we who are the circumcised, uh, we uh, do not glory in the flesh. Uh, we boast in Christ Jesus. And how do we serve God? We serve God by his spirit. So you see, the Judaizers were trying to keep the law in their own strength. And so while they were so busy, you know, straining out little gnats, they were swallowing entire camels. That is the condition that they were in. But then uh, we believers, we the actually the true circumcised, uh, he says, we serve God by his spirit. It is through the Holy Spirit alone that we, whatever works we do, these are works which are done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have a lovely scripture which brings out this. Uh, if someone could read out Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27, please. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to work in my statues and you will keep my judgments and do them. Amen. Yeah, it says over here, I will put my spirit in you and cause you and, you know, in, in the NIV, it says and, and move you to follow my decrees. So you see uh, now these things that we are doing, uh, it is not on our own. Uh, uh, we, are, we have no confidence in the flesh. We have no, um, you know, faith that we will be able to do anything for God on our own. Uh, but God has promised, he said, I will put my spirit in you and move you. I will cause you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So uh, so the, the believer, the, the truly circumcised person, he now lives out, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a way that pleases God. He fulfills the law. Uh, in the sense, uh, he, you know, uh, he he is serving God by the Spirit. So all of these things make the believers the truly circumcised people. Uh, on the other hand, the Judaizers are just simply mutilating their, their the flesh and humiliating uh, themselves. Okay, so um, so after having talked about this, he goes on to say, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. So, you know, he's saying, if I wanted to place my confidence in the flesh more than any of these Judaizers, I would be able to actually place more confidence in the flesh than even, than any of them. Uh, you know, because uh, after all, uh, he had uh, striven very, very hard in his past to be the ultimate Pharisee, to be the ultimate Jew. You see, his sincerity level was so high, he was so devo devoted to what he believed in, that he had gone way beyond these Judaizers in trying to uh, be the perfect Pharisee, in trying to be the perfect uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, person. So uh, he talks about all his past qualifications. So we see that in verses 4, 5, and 6. Uh, if someone could read out, please. Um, yeah, Philippians 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to the zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, Blameless. Yeah. So uh, he says, see, this is who I uh, actually am, you know, in the flesh. Uh, so he says, when it came to circumcision on the eighth day itself, you know, after I was born, my parents, you know, got me circumcised. Uh, and he says, as for uh, my status, you know, I'm not just an Israelite. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Um, the people of the tribe of Benjamin uh, were very proud of their status. Uh, simply because you know uh, Jerusalem, you know, falls within their boundaries, uh, and uh, the temple of God is is in in the boundaries of the tribe of Benjamin. So they felt that you know they are uh, higher. They literally have God's presence in their midst. So in that sense, you know, they consider themselves Hebrew of Hebrews. So he says, you know what? When it comes to status, I'm not just an Israelite. I'm in fact a Benjamite. In fact, that's probably the reason why you know his parents gave him the name Saul in honor of uh, you know the first king uh, who was from the tribe of benjamin you know so uh, so and then when it comes to uh, the law uh, he's not just somebody who keeps the law you know like the way average people do he in fact followed the law as a pharisee because as we know not only did they follow the mosaic laws they also had this a hundred other extra rules and regulations which they had come up with and he uh, was somebody who sincerely tried to keep all of those pharisaical laws as well. So that was his level of sincerity. Of course, when it comes to his zeal, he expressed his zeal and passion for the Jewish faith by persecuting Christians and trying to you know, snuff them out. Um, and um, then when it comes to uh, the righteousness based on the law, he says, faultless. I mean, that really amazes me, the word that he uses over there. He says, you know, ask anyone in my past, they will tell you I was faultless in the way I kept the Mosaic law. So yes, he probably failed a billion times in keeping the spirit of the law, but at least when it came to the letter of the law, he was so faultless in the way he kept it. So he says, 
more than anyone else i am the one who should be you know having uh, confidence in the flesh but this is what he says about all these wonderful badges of honor that he has you know he says um, this is what he says in verses 7 to 9 very very uh, interesting important words that he speaks um, verse 7 to 9 if someone could read out please verse 7 and 9 it says for what things are gained to me this i have counted loss for christ Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish and I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is true faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith so he says you know these were my badges of honor these were, these were my gains but now when i look at these gains i uh, you know uh, rather think of them as a loss i'm willing to give them up i'm willing to throw them aside you know as and you know dismiss them as a loss why why is he saying that he says for the sake of christ i am willing to take these badges of honor and i'm going to i want i want to just throw them away as a loss why because for the sake of christ uh, because you know he understands that uh, apart from christ uh, you have nothing apart from christ you are nothing you know it's something that he has clearly understood uh, if someone could read out galatians chapter 5 verses 2 to 4 which bring out this exact point galatians 5 2 to 4 Galatians 5:2 to 4. Indeed I Paul say to you that if you become circumcised Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. you know uh, he he says over there when he's writing to the galatians he says um if you hold on to the to the mosaic rituals and to circumcision and all of that um christ profits you nothing you know it's like christ has, has no more value for you uh, and in fact he says you are estranged you're alienated from christ uh, so you fall away from grace and you're back on your own you know you're now relying on the on your own works rather than uh, depending on the grace or being offered by god so uh, he does not want to be alienated estranged from christ he values christ he understands that that whatever he has today it is only because of christ and so he says for the sake of christ you know i take all these gains this badges of honor and i just fling them aside as a loss because they are nothing they cannot earn me you know christ uh, so uh, if i can have christ then i'm willing to give up anything you know it, it's basically what he is saying so he in fact um, goes on to say that in verse 8 so he says i consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing christ jesus my lord uh, so he says knowing christ jesus that has got surpassing worth it's got more worth than anything else so i'm willing to give up everything you know i mean if it had come to his roman citizenship i'm sure he would have been willing to give up that he was willing to give up the uh, the honor that he used to receive from the pharisees earlier he was willing to give it all up it none of it even mattered why because compared to all of that now knowing christ jesus has got surpassing worth you know much greater worth than all this previous things ever had uh, so that is the level uh, at which he places knowing christ jesus so for paul uh, when he had that encounter with jesus on the road to damascus you know it was not just that he got himself a ticket to heaven that day no on that day he got into a personal relationship with the very one uh you know whom he had been persecuting it, it it probably just took his breath away that that jesus you know um did not uh, retaliate against him with anger and wrath so even though he had been persecuting jesus actively the same jesus reached out to him in love 
and gave him a purpose and said, you know what? I'm going to use you. I'm going to uh, use you to you know reach out to the uh, to the Gentiles. Um, and so um, Paul understood the honor that he had been given, and he valued this personal relationship, you know, that Jesus had extended towards someone like him. And so he says, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, you know, makes it worth it. I mean, I'm willing to give up anything. Everything is a loss compared to having him knowing him is what he says. And uh, so he goes on to say in verse 8, I consider them garbage. You know, this badges of honor, these things that the Judaizers regard as something so honorable and great. He says all of these things. You know what? They are just garbage uh, when compared to uh, what I can actually have. If I give them up, then I can have Christ. And that is worth it. Um, so um, the term that is used over there for garbage, uh, that's the Greek word skybalon. Um, it's basically a combination of, um, of the two Greek words dog and uh, balon, which is to throw. So throwing to the dogs, I guess, would be the literal translation of sky balon. What did it mean? It just basically meant, you know, when you have uh, um, uh, you have your you 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 cook your meal and then you have your meal and all of that and all the scraps which are left you know you kind of throw them in the waste because it's just garbage uh, you know it, it's something fit for the dogs so you just throw it you know to the dogs so sky balloon literally was like you know waste from the table waste from the kitchen um, also it was uh, used by some for uh, dung you know. Uh, uh, the dung which gets dropped in the streets, even as the animals go by, you know, the donkeys go by and all of that. So uh, the, the sky balloon literally refers to scraps that are being thrown to the dogs. And uh, sky balloon also came to refer to uh, a dung, a dung of animals. So he says these badges of honor, um, they are like uh, mere, you know, uh, garbage. They are uh, nothing compared to uh knowing christ compared to what i can have in him okay so uh, that's what he is saying over here uh, which actually would have sounded pretty shocking to the Jew to the judaizers uh, simply because they had very low opinion of dogs and now what they value is being regarded as something thrown to the dogs fit only for the dogs so again you know it's a very very strong wording that um paul is using over here so he goes on to say, this is what I want, you know, because, you know, he says in uh, where in verse nine, he says, and be found in him. So you see, this is my desire. My deepest desire, he says, is to be found in uh, in Jesus. So he goes on to explain in what sense, uh, how he wants to be found in Jesus, in what way he, he wants to have this knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, so that he explains in verses 10 and 11. If someone could read out verses 10 and 11, please. Then I may... Go ahead, please. Go ahead, Asher. Thank you. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may, sh and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible, I mean, attain the resurrection from the dead. Yeah, so he's not just talking about knowing the blessings of Christ. Uh, he actually wants to know Christ himself. Um, in what sense? Uh, you know, um, he has understood what it is to be united with Christ to be in union with Christ, because these are, these are things that he touches upon in his other letters. Uh, so uh, just to refer to a couple of verses, uh, Galatians 2.20. This is what he says about being in Christ, you know, being united with Christ uh, in Galatians 2.20. Someone could read out. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He clearly understood what had happened in that moment of salvation, where he was crucified with Christ. So he understands. Now, you see, it is no longer I who live. I no longer live in any way that I wish to. But he says, Christ lives in me. 
So the life now I, I now live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God. So Christ gets to decide what I should do. Christ gets to decide how I live. Uh, so Christ gets to have his way, whatever he wants, his will, his way in my life. He has understood this. So it's not just going, uh, when he refers to knowing Christ, it's not just talking about, OK, I know, I know uh, uh, who Christ is, and I've had an encounter with him. It's talking about knowing Christ on a daily basis, where Christ is living out his life through Jesus, uh, through Paul. You know, sorry. Uh, so Paul uh, is submitting to Christ to the level where, on a daily basis, Christ is freely, comfortably living out his Christ life through this man, Paul. So it is knowing Christ to that extent, uh, um, you know, to that level of trust and intimacy, where Paul is willing to trust uh, Jesus to that extent, where he allows Christ to just have his way in his life. Um, and uh, so you know, he says, I live by faith in the Son of God. So that's the level of faith that he chooses to place you know, in the Son of God. Um, we'll just look at one more reference, uh, Colossians 3.3. If someone could please read out Colossians 3.3. 3. Colossians 3.3. 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So again, he talks about you know, the crucifixion that has happened in, in that moment of salvation. And he says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. So you see, Everything about your life should be hidden in Jesus Christ. Um, he gets to have his way. He gets to decide. Uh, and you are safe in him. You're hidden in him. Uh, it's no longer you trying to assert yourself. You submit to him. You live uh, how by, the, by faith in the Son of God. And uh, so you are literally led by him. So in that context, having understood these things, he says, I want to know Christ. Yes to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. And he goes on to say in verse 11, uh, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the uh, dead. Uh, so uh, he, he says in this context that, uh, you know, he wants to participate in the sufferings of Christ. He wants to participate in the sufferings of Christ because by doing so, he knows that one day, you know, uh, he will um, be uh, re uh, be resurrected. Uh, so, how do we understand this? Um, maybe we could first uh, touch upon the you know, the the resurrection part, where uh, the power of his resurrection. Maybe that that first phrase. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. Let's just you know take a look at that. Um, maybe we can uh, refer to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, to kind of catch that first. Uh, Ephesians 1, 19 to 20. Ephesians 1, 19 to 20. It reads, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he walked in christ when he raised him up when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places yeah so he is saying uh you know this is the kind of mighty power that is now at work in me so because of this mighty work uh this mighty power that is work at, that is at work in me, I am able to participate in the sufferings of Christ. So he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. So he is not uh, volunteering to, you know, just uh, on his own, in his own strength, participate in the sufferings of Christ. He understands that it's going to be through the power of Jesus' resurrection. It is God who is going to enable him to be able to participate in the sufferings of Christ. Uh, so uh, his life is hidden in Christ, and he's going to be uh, Christ is going to be able to live out his life through Paul, and it's all going to happen by the 
power of his resurrection and paul by allowing himself to you know cooperate in all of this he gets to know the resurrection power of god he gets to know what it is like to participate in the sufferings of christ and he is willing to go through all of this because he knows what he is aiming for one day just like christ he too will be resurrected uh, where he will receive a glorified resurrected body so he is aiming towards um, very high things he knows he knows so there's something very beautiful awaiting him in the future and so um, he's also aware that you to reach there to get there you would have to allow christ to live out his life in you i no longer live but christ lives in me so he understands the process so he wants to know christ in this way not at just a superficial level where you just have a kind of acquaintance with the blessings of christ and leave it at that but no he wants to know christ himself to the extent where he's um, where he's participating in the sufferings of christ uh, where he is um, you know allowing the resurrection power of christ to work in and through him because all of this will lead to one day his being glorified you know uh, when when we are all resurrected at that time uh, so he uh, yeah uh, we we will have to take a break right now uh, so we'll come back and we'll continue uh, verse 12 onwards so uh, if we can all log back uh, in at 10 o'clock please thank you <laughs> 